Today I'm going to be demonstrating colored pencil on pastel mat and giving you my first impressions of using colored pencil on this surface. For those of you who have requested updates about my aquarium, make sure to check out the end of this video where I'm going to be sharing my new fish. So onto the pastel mat. The one that I have here, it's 170 pounds. It's a really thick cardstock. You can see it's got this sheet in between each paper. So all the sheets are just in absolutely perfect, perfect condition before you start working on them. This one is nine and a half by 12 inches that I'm working on. Now I expected this to be closer to sanded paper having a rougher surface and it doesn't. It actually is very, very smooth, but it's just rough enough that your pigment really, really sticks to the paper as you'll see as we get started in this project. If you're supporters over on Patreon, make sure to head over there where you've got the two hour version of this tutorial, so way slowed down. Those videos are great because they give me more time to really explain things more thoroughly than what I have time to do here on these YouTube videos. If you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer one to two, sometimes three hour tutorials. I've got over 150 of them available for you now. If you wanna check out what videos and what lessons I have, you can head over to my video library. I will have a link in the video description. While you're there, you also get access to a free two hour long Margay and colored pencil demonstration. So that gives you a bit of a taste of what Patreon is really like. Now I had no idea what to expect with this paper. So I started like I normally would where I drew everything out with a graphite pencil. For my background, it's a decent size. It's kind of big. I wanted it to be blurry, out of focus. And so I went with my Derwent drawing pencils because these ones are very, very waxy and they blend really easily. No matter what paper you work on, they just blend so nicely. But here, the thing that surprised me was how well they blended. This is not what I expected. So here's my first layer. I'm just using a base brown. And you can see my first layer is going to be very grainy, gritty, not, not at all like what my end result is going to be. I'm being careful to work around my roses as I, I do this. Now, normally to get a background blended like this, to get it really, really smooth, it would probably take me, I'd say three to five additional layers to get to that stage. And that is where I was really, really surprised. And it was almost just instantly, I knew I was going to love this paper. I had to see still if it worked well on fine details, but I had a feeling at this point that it, it was going to be a good choice. As I'm working through, you can see my pencil strokes. I'm working every which direction. I'm being very messy. Now, one of the things that I typically recommend for people to do is keep their pencils very sharp and work in small kind of oval shaped movements so that you don't have real harsh start and stop points with your pencil. But on this paper, and I knew you can kind of get away with not doing that as much with the Derwent drawing pencils because they do blend so well. But with this one, I was pretty messy. Now I'm taking a polychromos and I'm going over this. I wanted to have this orangey. Oh no, I lied. That's not polychromos. That's still Derwent drawing. I'm going over with this kind of orangey color. Technical term there, orangey. Now I love the Derwent drawing pencils. Man, I wish they came in more colors. They blend so well. The lead is very, very thick. It's a very soft lead, but they blend really nicely. They, it's pretty limited on the colors available there. Now I'm taking black right along the upper edges just to darken that up. Actually, I lied again. That's not black. That is, I want to say that color is called cho chocolate. It's just a really dark brown. This video is full of misinformation for you guys. So once I got this layer on here, again, I expected to have to repeat this process three to five times. That's what I typically do. Now the trick with odorless mineral spirits, no matter what paper you're using, is that you want a lot of pencil pigment on the paper. If you try to blend out when you don't have a ton of pigment on there, the OMS just really doesn't have a lot to work with. So that's why I add so many layers before I ever blend out. So here is my Taclon Bristled Filbert, and look at that, it looks like a watercolor pencil. I was shocked to see that level of color saturation my first time blending out. That is definitely not normal for what I've experienced before. Now it felt a lot like watercolor too, very, my brush stroke showed, so you, you can get a very painterly look with this. Now here I was letting my brush stroke show a little bit so that I got that kind of blotchy look, which is, like I said before, what I was going with, going for. And see now how it, it fades from that orangey brown color 
technical term still, up into that darker brown. So I had a medium base brown first, that orange tone towards the bottom, and then the darker brown at the top, and that gives me this nice vignette look. Now normally, like I said, I would go over that so many more times, and I didn't need to. That saved me so, I mean, it was done so quickly. And then because this paper has a little bit of a tooth to it, more so than like the hot press watercolor paper I typically work with, the way that the tooth is on this, your pencils stick to it better. You end up with more pigment on the paper faster than if you're using the normal hot press watercolor paper, which is pretty amazing for speed if you're trying if you want to work in colored pencils but you want the process to go faster i think this is a great choice now you do have to be a bit careful because when you blend with the odorless mineral spirits it's like working with watercolor pencils a little bit more not as much it doesn't spread as much as watercolor or ink tense would but it does spread when you add that oms a lot more than it ha it does on let's say stonehenge or a hot press watercolor paper now I've got to let that dry completely in between layers. Once that's dry, I came through with the darker, well, darker brown there because I missed a spot, but I'm using purple for my shadows here. Don't always think that you want to jump straight to black for shadows. I use black, the colored pencil black all the time, but you don't want to just assume that's always the color you want to use for shadows. In this case, purple made for a much better fit. I can use black on the deepest shadows, but purple for the outer edges into the paper or the wood grain there really worked a lot better. And as I blend this out, I want to work that brush side to side so any brush strokes I have just look like they're part of the wood grain. Now there were some questions in the live stream someone had brought up. They were told that using this pastel mat that it was not recommended to use odorless mineral spirits on it, that it would do something weird to the paper. So I contacted the company directly and heard back to them and they said, no, the odorless mineral spirits are fine. You don't want to oversaturate it because it could damage the paper, but from the sounds of it, it's the same as any paper you use. I oversaturated mine like crazy and it did not cause any damage to the paper. This held up really well. Now, when I say over, my idea of oversaturated may not be the same as yours. So, you know, use caution there. You don't want to just puddle this all over. I could definitely see that being a bit of a problem. Now I'm going to go ahead and start on the leaves here. Most of these leaves are slightly out of focus from my reference photo. If you are a member of Patreon, you've got access to this reference photo. This was one of the reference photos I took that I provide to you guys every month for your own artwork. So you guys have full rights to use this in your own, own work to sell, make prints, anything you like. I'm using a combination of many different greens. Some of them are kind of a yellow green, an olive green. I've added blue and purple to the leaf up above. So I've got a, a combination of warm and cool greens all over the place here. Now, one of the fun things with green, that is a color that all greens look good next to all other greens. And not every color you can say that with. Sometimes if you mix warm and cool blues, they look a little weird together. Not always, sometimes. But greens, you're pretty safe in using several next to each other. It was one of the things, like if you're doing design in your home, you can put a cool green pillow right next to a, a warm, muddy green or, you know, whatever colors, and they work really, really well still. So when you're working with your colored pencils, I always felt like that was a color that I could be a bit more free on and use all the greens next to each other pretty safely and still have it look okay. So we're going to speed this part up a bit because this was from the live stream. So you can watch this section in real time. But look how I'm able to add one layer, blend it out, and it's so, so, so blended. It's so soft. I don't have that grainy, gritty look that you typically would get from just one layer of pencil and blending with odorless mineral spirits. For those of you who are using or have tried odorless mineral spirits and felt like it made your color look more dull, that's two reasons that happens. One, you didn't have enough pigment on the paper before you blend it out. You didn't ruin anything. You just want to add more layers. Two is that you typically just need to add more layers anyway. You're going to keep building that up until you get your color saturation where you want it to be. Now, typically when I blend with odorless mineral spirits, the first time blending out or my first layer blending out with OMS, I, do, I can use a fair amount of the odorless mineral spirits on the brush. It can be really wet. When I get to final layers where I've done several layers and I'm, I go to blend it out, I want to use almost nothing on that brush. Very, very little. I want it to be almost dry. Not quite, but almost. With each additional layer, I'm going to use less and less odorless mineral spirits. And I just dab that on an old rag or a Viva paper towel. And with odorless mineral spirits, you want to use Viva, not your regular like Bounty or something like that. Viva is the only one that's cloth-like enough that it'll work with the OMS, but an old t-shirt or something like that works too. 
that I will dry off quite a bit of it towards those final layers because what happens if you have a lot of OMS on your brush and you have a lot a lot of pigment on that paper, you know, you're several layers in, it'll get to where the, the brush will start lifting and moving that pigment around more than what you want it to. So that's why each additional layer I'll use less and less. But those first layer, two layers, I can pretty much use a lot and not have any problems. Now for these roses, I'm using a combination of magentas, oranges, yellows, and reds. I think I used every yellow I own, which is saying something because I feel like all of the colored pencil companies make too many yellows. I used a lot of them on this one though. I was grateful for them for once. And you can see I'm using a lot of my polychromos here. Those worked really well on this paper too. Now I've done colored pencil work on sanded paper. I think if I weren't going to use odorless, or I'm sorry, if I weren't going to use powder blender, then the pastel matte would be my preference. But if I'm going to use powder blender, hands down, go with the sanded paper. Powder blender does not work well. It doesn't work as intended, I should say, on pastel matte. And for blending with odorless mineral spirits, this is now absolutely one of my favorites. And it's not, for me, I don't choose one favorite paper and I'm never gonna use any other paper. I like to use many. I mean, the piece that I'm working on right now with colored pencil, that's being done on the Fabriano Artistico Extra White Hot Press 140 pound watercolor paper. I like to use a lot of different things all the time. So it's not like this is replacing everything for me. But it's definitely one of my preferences and you can just, it's so much faster to work on. I think that's going to be a huge draw for a lot of people that feel like colored pencil just takes too long. This paper, oh my gosh, I, I finished this piece so, so much faster. Maybe half the time. I don't remember. I did it a couple months ago. But it, it felt like about, I would say half the time that I would normally spend on something this size. And it took my wax and oil-based pencils. All of them worked perfectly on this. I wouldn't say one was better than the other. The other thing that I really liked about this is when I came on top of it with my white pencils, it stood out really well. So often the white pencils don't really stand out that much on paper. The, whether I use my polychromos or my Derwent drawing, Derwent drawing, of course, is going to be the, the brightest white, luminance right behind that. But on this paper, because it had so much tooth, there was so much for that pencil to stick to that the highlights really, really did stand out nicely. Normally on something like this where I wanted to get the brighter highlights in, I would use my Touch Up Texture Titanium White Mixture. I didn't need to on this one. My whites were standing out just from, from having so much grip on the paper. They stood out great. My concern had always been if you used a paper that had too much tooth, your end result was going to look really rough. And that would be especially hard if you were drawing portraits or something like that. But that is definitely not the case. The same thing with the sanded paper. It you can really blend things out so that you don't end up with that really, really rough look that I always thought you would have. Because if you use a cold pressed watercolor paper, you get that really rough look. So I thought it was going to be the same using pastel matte or using sanded paper, and it isn't. They, this texture, the pencils blend so, so nicely on and still look very smooth. You, it doesn't look like I'm using a textured rough surface. Now here's a big tip for you. You would think at this stage, okay, there's color on the roses, it's finished. But watch what happens when I keep working on it, when I start from this stage, start hyping up the contrast, getting those deeper shadows in there. Another big tip, don't use black or don't jump straight to black to add shadows on yellow or orange colors. So with this yellow, or, or, wow, rose, I can't talk. Words are hard. With the yellow rose, if I came through with black to add my shadows, I'm going to end up with this very muddy, weird, kind of greenish gray, not attractive color. It won't look good. Instead, if I take purples and magentas, that's going to give me a far more rich color. A, and even it'll look more realistic too, but those colors usually will look best if you want to add shadows onto orange or yellow colors. Try your magentas and purples first. Now, there are times I need to use black to shade things, but as much as I can, especially on these colors, I want to avoid that and just save it for any really, really dark areas that I can't get dark enough with the magentas or the purples. I'm using some pinks to shade as well. And that pink over the yellow, it'll give me a nice orange tint without being too bright orange. 
if you're looking for reference photos of roses, just go to the grocery store, especially when they clearance out some of them, because you don't need them to last long. You just need them to last long enough to get reference photos for them. And sometimes when the leaves or the petals start to look a little bit worn or aged, it looks even prettier for your artwork. But if you go into, that's usually where I get them. Of course, avoid holidays because they get stupid expensive, but you can get a good amount of roses for less than five dollars at the grocery store that's usually where I'll get mine and then I just go home and take a whole bunch of photos of them before they completely go bad and if you don't have some amazing lighting set up to get those reference photos don't worry about that ideally use natural light if you can set it up to where you have early morning or late afternoon sunlight coming through your window for your reference photos you're going to get some of the best results quite often more so than using really expensive lighting setups. You just have to find the right time coming through where the light's just right coming through the window. So you'll have to play around with that a bit. But you don't need an expensive setup to get really amazing reference photos of flowers or, or any type of still life that you want to do. So you can see here just layering loosely where my lights and darks are going to go. I can correct these colors later. And I've gone a lot darker here than you can see the one area is going to need to be lightened up a lot, but the white will stick on top of it so well, it's easy to do. Now, once I've blended that out, I'm going around a lot of these edges. See how I make them much more sharp? And on this paper, I didn't find that I needed my pencils to be nearly as sharp as what I need them to be on a hot pressed watercolor paper or Stonehenge. I'm not sure why I keep bringing up Stonehenge. I haven't used that paper in a really long time. I should do a piece on the, that sometime soon. It's been a while. Now, when you're drawing flowers, look at it as abstract shapes. Don't look at it as, I'm drawing a rose, because your brain's going to try to take over and say, I know what a rose looks like. We don't even need that reference photo. Your end result doesn't look so much like a rose. I mean, kind of, maybe a folk art rose, but not a realistic rose. If you want your work to look realistic, look at the abstract shapes in your reference photo and try to copy what you see. If you see yellow, add yellow. If you see something lighter or darker, and really watch your values. Your values matter more than your color. Get your darks dark enough and your lights light enough. But look at all of this. That doesn't look like a flower or a rose. It looks like an abstract. The area that I'm working on right now doesn't look anything like a flower. Now, when it all comes together, it absolutely does. But you've got to look at it while you're working working on it as abstract shapes and just copy what you see on that reference photo. Now for students who are interested in getting involved and painting portraits, I will usually recommend they first master drawing whatever medium you're working in, master roses. Roses are a really good way to practice blending smoothly, getting your contrast, getting your lights and darks, but you still feel like you you've created something pretty because if a, a flower petal is out of place, no big deal. If a nose or an eye on a portrait is out of place, it's a pretty big deal. So if you can focus more on the roses first, really get a good understanding of how to blend and shade. When you move on to doing portraits, if that's something that interests you, it's going to be way easier. But it, roses are a great, great way because you've got detail where you've got harsh and soft lines. So you're paying attention to both of those and you're learning your blending and layering. So it's way easier to learn those things on this subject matter versus a person. And same thing, it's just a rinse and repeat, really, of where are my lights, where are my darks. I can adjust the color later on. None of that's a big deal right now. Just kind of get my general shapes in there. And your flower petals do not have to be perfect. I actually changed some of mine from what my reference photo was just because I thought it looked better if I removed a few of them that were sticking out kind of funny. But don't get upset if it doesn't look exact like your photo because no one's going to notice the difference with this subject. Portraits, yes. Roses, not so much. Once I get all of my flowers blocked in, I can go back through and hype up my contrast on the background a bit and the foreground. One of the things on this one that I didn't really like is I felt that the background colors didn't work that well. It was too muted, too brown to work with the roses. And so I'm going to go back through and pull in some magentas on top of that. So don't feel like, oh, I finished the background. I can't go back and change it. You can go back and forth all you want from the foreground, the background, whatever you need to. You want to balance everything out. And that was something that I couldn't see until I got my rose colors in. Now that they were in, I was able to see that I needed something a little bit deeper in color to balance everything out.
using this really pale blue color. Now this was another color that was not in my reference photo, but oh, I love this. Adding blue to yellow colors and oranges. Look at how it makes the oranges feel more bold and more vibrant. And I didn't change the orange. I just pulled a little bit of that, that sky blue, little tiny bit of that into both the background leaves and the flower petals. And that wasn't based on, there should be a highlight here. This is where the light would be hitting it. It was just based on, I think it'd be pretty if there was blue here. So that's where you get to take a few artistic liberties just to make something look a little bit nicer. But don't go through if you're going to do that with the blue. I don't recommend going through and just outlining everything harshly because that's going to give you a different, a, a very stylized look, which if that's the look you're going for, great. But if not, if you're just trying to get a, a few little highlights, a little bit of extra detail and color in there, you don't want to just go through and outline everything because that's going to give you more of a cartoony feel. So if you look at where that blue was added, see how it's a, it feels a little bit more random. It's not just all the way along the edge of every petal. Now, when you blend purple in on top of your yellow, you're going to get a more neutral, almost a brownish tone. It's not going to stay really bright purple. Those two colors are complementary, and so they're going to neutralize each other a bit. It gives you a really nice, soft look. And look at how well that white stood out on top of that paper. It just so amazes me how much that just glowed. Another really big tip I have for you is just take your time. Don't try, well, I do say that this goes a lot faster and you can get things done faster on the pastel mat. Don't feel like you have to rush. Take your time. This looks like I had it done in a few minutes, but the reality was I spent several days working on this piece. And give yourself some breaks. Step away from it. When you've been sitting in front of the easel looking or however you work, looking at artwork for too long, your eyes just start losing track of what it is that you're trying to see in that reference photo. Step away, give yourself a bit of a break and then come back in and really refine details as needed or a contrast. Focus at this point when you get to the end of your piece on your contrast and values. So here I'm taking that magenta and this is really going to make a big difference in deep, making the background a lot deeper so that the roses stand out more. And it, it just, I felt like it pulled everything together a lot better than that muted brown that I had. Now here, I don't want very much odorless mineral spirits on my brush at all. That brush is nearly dry because I already have so much pigment on the paper from the first time blending out. So that brush, you can see it's not, you're not really seeing a whole lot of brush strokes. It is nearly dry. Here I've got a bit more paint thinner on it. And you can see that by how dark it gets as I'm blending out here. That'll lighten up a bit as the paper dries. Then back through, doing a few more details. Remember, when you blend out with the odorless mineral spirits, let that paper dry all the way before you put more pencil on top of it. If you don't, you can damage the tooth of your paper pretty badly if you work a hard pencil on top of wet paper. And here, I'm really focusing on getting the edges that need to be harsh, sharpening those up. Now, don't feel like every line in your work needs to be a harsh edge. That's something that I think, uh, being a new artist, that's something that we all really do. We try to make every single line harsh. Don't do that. You want some to be soft and fade out. But pay attention to that reference photo. Which of your edges need to be soft versus which of your edges need to be harsh? That makes a big, big difference in the end result. So there is my finished painting. I am absolutely in love with this paper. Thank you so much to Carla who sent this to me. This paper came all the way down from Canada. But it is absolutely wonderful. I definitely need to buy some bigger sheets of it for bigger projects. Last month, I needed to go get some more hermit crabs. I had a bit of green hair algae that was starting to show up on one of my rocks and my crabs were just not taking care of it. So I decided, decided? That's not a word. Decided to head over to Glass Aquatics, which is the local fish store that's my absolute favorite, and give them a little bit of a hard time picking out these crabs. Now keep in mind, these hermit crabs all look exactly the same. You really can't tell a difference. They're all the blue-legged her hermit crabs that I was there for. No, not that one. No, he's not cute enough. The other one looked like he had more spots on his feet. No, smaller than that. Maybe next to him, not that one, like back three. That's not even a... Mm, no, I 
don't think I like that one. Once I was done messing with them about the hermit crabs, I also decided to pick up a fish that had been in the store for a couple of months, so I knew he was eating well, super healthy, and I thought he would be a great addition to my tank. Okay, catch him. Okay, catch him? Catch him. Don't hurt him. Be gentle. That's why I need two nets. They're extremely quick. So here is Lestat Colin at home. He is a firefish goby. He has done perfectly in my tank. He's a really good eater. He likes every single food that I've offered him. He goes crazy over. So he's been a really fun, fun addition to the aquarium. Have you subscribed yet? If not, there's a handy round button right there you can click on that'll help you to keep up to date with all of my new art videos every single week. You can also sign up for my free email newsletter where I give you art motivation and tips and update you on any videos coming out.